but I couldn't come up with a title uh, that did justice to it. And, um, and, you know, Mayflower is how it begins. And so, yeah, it's, it, 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 it leads you <laughs> in one direction. And it doesn't do justice to what the book is about. But I, I was baffled at trying to come up with something else that would do it justice. And, you know, and ultimately now when I look back, I mean, because this book came out 14 years ago, you know, I think it is the right title. It's, it's, it's how a voyage that has this iconic status in American history led to the, you know, to, uh, it was a voyage to war in many ways. Uh, it would take five decades to unwind, to, to evolve, but, um, and so there it goes. But yes, it's, um, um, many readers go, wait, this is not the story of a voyage. Um, this is something different. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to your library. I'm David Leonard, BPL president and host for your program this evening. I'm coming to you live from the Bates Hall Reading Room here at Copley Square at the Central Library in Boston. Our Baxter Lecture is designed to promote commemorative and public understanding of the history of the settlement of and immigration to New England. We hope that tonight's conversation is the beginning of marking our 400 year anniversaries and looking at the history of New England, a set of stories to be told from multiple perspectives. James Finney Baxter's vision of America is one that holds high the promise of liberty, justice and equality for all. We too need to recognize where we are on the calendar. November is Native American Heritage Month first marked traditional, uh, nationally in 1990, but with roots as far back as at least 1915, reminding us that the voices of those who were here before us, us defined as modern Americans, and their descendants must be centered in discussions of New England and American history. Now, just yesterday, at approximately 10 a.m., 400 years ago, the travelers on the Mayflower set foot on what is now Provincetown on the tip of Cape Cod. Tonight, our focus is on those who arrived on the Mayflower. Who were they? Did they come by choice? Were they fleeing Europe? What were their intentions? What were the early experiences with the native peoples? What went well? And how soon did things start to go terribly wrong? To fully engage with matters of history, we have collaborated with several amazing partners, the New England Historic Genealogical Society, GBH Forum Network, and the State Library of Massachusetts. Before I get to introduce our guest moderator and guest, I would like to invite to offer a greeting, Beth Carol Horrocks of the Massachusetts State Library, where she is the head of special collections. We, we did have our own series of author events that were curtailed by the uh, pandemic. So we're very glad to be collaborating with all of you tonight for this Baxter lecture. So this discussion is of particular interest to us because of, as many of you know, the State Library has been the custodian of William Bradford's manuscript of Plymouth Plantation since its return from England in 1897. The, the, that story, the story of its return, its travels, is very complicated and it's fascinating and there's been many published accounts of it. So I, I hope you'll look into that story. So after Governor Roger Walcott placed the manuscript at the State Library, the original volume was on public display for many years in our beautiful reading room. But our curatorial responsibilities have changed and significantly. So we now work really hard to make the work available to as many people as possible digitally and through facsimiles. So you can see the entire volume on our website and later in the talk we'll have a, a link that you can use to get to that and the link will also be in our chat function. So after we reopen, I hope you'll all come and visit the State Library. Uh, you, we can, you can see many different versions of the published manuscript and we also have some facsimiles. So we look forward to seeing you. We also look forward to this discussion tonight with Nathaniel Philbrick, whose work Mayflower relied heavily on the Bradford manuscript. So back to you, David. 
Beth, thanks so much. And we'll, we'll hear at the end of the program about more resources and events coming from the State Library. We also want to let you all know that if you want to get a copy of this book or other works by Nathaniel Philbrick, please contact Trident Booksellers and Cafe. They are our partner uh, on tonight's program and will be um, able to ship it to you for free. And so uh, without further ado, I would like to now introduce um, our main guest and our guest moderator for the discussion. And with apologies to our two guests, I have shortened their bios slightly. Ryan Woods is Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society, the country's largest and leading nonprofit genealogical organization. Founded in 1845, three years before the BPL. Today, it provides access to 1.4 billion searchable names through its award-winning website, AmericanAncestors.org. NEHGS is also the preeminent provider of Mayflower family history research and scholarship. And they have created an interactive online portal for all things Mayflower at mayflower.americanancestors.org. Ryan is personally descended from four Mayflower passengers and important for this evening, he is highly familiar with Nathaniel Philbrick's works as Philbrick received a Lifetime Achievement Award for American History and Biography from NEHGS in 2015. Nathaniel Philbrick was born in Boston, Massachusetts. He was Brown University's first intercollegiate All-American sailor in 1978, the same year he won the Sunfish North Americans in Barrington, Rhode Island. Author of many books in this area covering sailing, the ocean, and history, I will highlight just three. In 2000, Philbrick published the New York Times bestseller, In the Heart of the Sea, which won the National Book Award for nonfiction. The book was the basis of the 2015 movie of the same name, directed by Ron Howard, as well as a Dateline special and the 2010 PBS American Experience film, Into the Deep by Rick Burns. The New York Times bestseller, Mayflower, was a finalist for both the 2007 Pulitzer Prize in History and the LA Times Book Award. It won the Massachusetts Book Award for nonfiction and was named one of the best books of 2006 by the New York Times Book Review. Mayflower is currently in development as a limited series on FX. In 2010, he published the New York Times bestseller, The Last Stand, which was named a New York Times notable book, a 2010 Montana Book Award and a 2011 ALA notable book. Philbrick was an on-camera consultant to the two-hour PBS American Experience film, Cutler's Last Stand by Stephen Ives. The book is currently being adapted for a 10-hour multi-part television series. There are literally too many awards to list them all tonight. Philbrick's writing has also appeared in several popular and media publications, and he has appeared on the Today Show, The Morning Show, Dateline, PBS's American Experience, C-SPAN, and NPR. And he and his wife currently live on Nantucket. You can review the full biography online. And now, Ryan, Nathaniel, welcome. Welcome to the program. And Ryan, over to you. Thank you, David. Oh, hello, Nat. It's uh, so nice to be with you, uh, virtually or otherwise. Yes, Ryan, it is great to see you. Uh, in these days, uh, any kind of contact, virtual or otherwise, is, is very welcome. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to our conversation this evening and uh, many questions from our audience, uh, a record-breaking audience, as I understand it, for a program like this. Uh, this year, uh, of course, is the 400th anniversary of the landing of the Mayflower, in September of 1620, 102 passengers, men, women, and children, and a crew of approximately 30 people left England aboard the Mayflower to seek freedom to practice their religion and opportunity in the new world. Those passengers, of course, did not land in a place devoid of people or culture. They arrived in the Wampanoag Nation. And herein lies a story of two cultures 
And as we commemorate the landing of the Mayflower, we honor the story of the pilgrims and the native Wampanoag people whose stories collectively and individually, I think embody the, the triumphs and tragedies of life in early New England and the country itself. I reminded of a, a line from Samuel Eliot Morrison who said that the place of the Pilgrim Fathers in American history can best be stated as a paradox of slight importance in their own time they are of great and increasing significance in our time. And so we turn to you to help us understand why. Uh, I'd first like to begin talking about your inspiration for this book. Uh, many of your books have centered on tales of the sea. And while of course a voyage across the ocean plays a part in the Mayflower story, how did you come to decide to write a book about the pilgrims? Well, you know, it, I did not see it coming. Uh, when I grew up, I, like many Americans, uh, would be involved every, every Thanksgiving time in, in the annual Thanksgiving Day pageant um, in school. And, uh, and you know, I was a, a, a radical child of the 60s who, who kind of came to think of the pil you know, what could be more boring than the pilgrims? I mean, what did they have to do with the America I was living in, this, this land of, of upheaval? And, and I just, you know, it just with their buckled shoes and their funny hats, you know, what did they have to do with America? Well, in 1986, I moved with uh, my wife, Melissa, and our two kids to Nantucket. And uh, it was, I loved it because it's the, Moby Dick was my favorite novel of all time. And here we were at the hollowed ground of, of the Pequod. And I became fascinated with the island's history and began researching what would become a way offshore, my first work of history about the, the island. And, and trying to put the Nantucket in the context of New England, I read of William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation. Bradford being um, longstanding governor of, of Plymouth Plantation in its early years. And this was, a, this, it, it was completely different from what I had thought of as the stereotypical pilgrims. I mean, this was a story full of all sorts of uh, turmoil and um, violence on occasion, um, you know, all sorts of you know, details that I had no idea of. These were beginning to feel like real people. And it was then as I was continuing my research for Way Offshore, and I was uh, dealing uh, very heavily in primary source documents on Nantucket. I was in the town building on Nantucket, looking where they have the um, record for the town meetings. And it was a town meeting in 1665. I mean, it's just amazing that you know, there are these records. I was holding it in my hand. And it refers to um, Philip um, uh, coming over and uh, attending a meeting. Philip being the English name for Medicon. Uh, the, the uh, leader of the Wampanoag people, the son of Massasoit, who was the one who, who first established contact with the pilgrims. And Nantucket is 65 miles from um, the headquarters of, of the Wampanoag at that time. And, I, you know, why was Philip there? What was going on here? Uh, and, and then I began to learn more and more about King Philip's War, named for Philip, King Philip, uh, and this terrible um, English native conflict that uh, completely destroyed all the promise um, that uh, was established in the early years of Plymouth Colony as far as a biracial, bicultural community. And I, I realized there's a story here that I, I want to find, follow. And, um, and so that led me to uh, set off on the, the research journey uh, that would ultimately lead to Mayflower. Well, as you note, the, the Pilgrim and Native story, and of course, the first Thanksgiving is one of the most widely taught history lessons in America. You know, to a, a large extent, every child in the country and therefore every person educated here learns some basic elements of this tale. So given the relatively popular nature of this history, uh, what were your aims for retelling this story? Yeah, well, you know, by this time I had, uh established kind of uh, my niche in history. I, I'm interested in the dark side of things. Um, it's not necessarily the triumphs I'm interested in, it's the struggle. Um, because I think those struggles bring out the, the profound truths of human nature. And, um, you know, we all 
know the story of the pilgrims as, as presented in, in those pageants on Thanksgiving. That's not the story at all. And what I wanted to do was get at what I felt was not the story we all know, but the story we really need to know. And that's the story of how, um, yes, there is the first Thanksgiving, uh, which um, despite all of the mythic nature of it, there is an inspirational core to that, where uh, two peoples came to a point where they were living and celebrating together. But there also is what happened in the next generation, King Philip's War, in which the promise of, of this potentially bicultural community was completely blown apart in a, uh, a war, a native English war that would be many times bloodier than the Civil War the war most of us look to as the, the bloodiest conflict in America, not in terms of total death, but in terms of percentage of people killed. And so I wanted to take, I wanted to begin with the voyage of the Mayflower, that, you know, sort of that voyage that so many Americans look to as, as kind of the archetypal iconic beginning and, and take it to a place uh, that, that uh, did not create this, this sort of inspirational exception to the rule of American history, uh, in which there was this often brutal march west uh, towards the, the Pacific. I wanted to show how this story in so many troubling ways anticipated um, what would be the history of America as it made its way across this country. And so that's, that, was, that was my aim. A grand ambition indeed. Um, before we delve a little bit deeper into the story, could you help provide some foundational context for who the pilgrims of the Mayflower were and their motivations for crossing the Atlantic into the so-called New World? Yeah, well, you know, the, the pilgrims were uh, separatists, uh, which meant uh, they were Protestants, uh, but they believed that uh, they, they did not believe in, in the Church of England, of, of established norms of of, of, the, of of worship, they felt they should go their own way in a, in a, in a covenant. And that was there, uh, they should have the ability to select their minister. And uh, they really believed in a community of faith, getting as they, they viewed the, the traditions of the church uh, as impurities uh, that got in the way of a human's ability to commune with God. And so uh, this was illegal uh, in England at the time. Uh, you, you had to, it was the, the, the church, Church of England was the state church. And so they were uh, the core of what would become known as the pilgrims were in, in uh, sort of the mid, middle northern part of England in a little town called Scrooby, uh, which I had the pleasure of visiting uh, while researching uh, this book. And um, and it was there that um, a young William Bradford was attracted to the separatist uh, uh, congregation that was meeting in secret um, uh, and, and in the home of William Brewster. And uh, they were eventually found out. Uh, and, it, and if they were going to continue to worship, they had to flee England. It would take them several attempts, but they would end up in Holland, uh, where there was a, a greater, uh, uh, there was religious freedom, relatively speaking. And so, I mean, this is just an outrageous, audacious thing to do. The other separatists had done this. They were uh, uh, first went to Amsterdam um, it, for a variety of reasons. They ended up in Leiden, uh, Holland, uh, which you can visit today and see the steps of, down which the uh, pilgrims went uh, before they boarded the, the, the boats that would ultimately take them um, on, their, on their voyage. And, and so um, there, under the, the uh, charismatic leadership of Minister John Robinson, they created a, a, um, an intensely um, uh, uh, felt congregation of, of worship. And um, uh, Bradford would look back to this as, as kind of the ideal of what they were looking to establish. But the problem was, uh, they were living in Holland, uh, working very hard in the textile trade, a um, whole level of, of, of labor uh, that uh, was very different from being a farmer uh, in England. And their children were becoming Dutch. And even though they had elected to leave England, they were proudly English. Uh, they, they wanted to, to 
somehow return to that, and yet they couldn't go back to England. What to do? Well, it's obvious. You sail across 3,000 miles of ocean and go to what they call <laughs> the New World. They saw it as, as a blank slate upon which they could recreate their congregation and, um, and uh, re get back with their English roots and, and all would be well. I mean, uh, you know, it, is, they, it was an outrageous proposal, uh, but they felt that was what their, their God wanted them to do. And so that uh, became uh, their aim. There's a, a large contingent of these Mayflower passengers who are the, the so-called saints that you've just described. Uh, but there are, there's another group, a term that is used, the strangers. Could you speak to uh, their motivations? And who were these individuals who eventually joined in the voyage? Yeah, well, when the Mayflower left, about half, um, uh, the passengers uh, were not were not separatists. Uh, they they were uh, Church of England people who were not out to create. Their main aim was not to create a, a you know a, was not religiously centered. It was to find uh, find greater opportunity in the new world, and um, and and they wanted to the more economic opportunity. And so they were on a very different wavelength. Uh, from the pilgrims. They, for example, celebrated Christmas. The, the pilgrims did not believe that, you know, that was not in, in the Bible. There, there should be no celebration of that, you know, so there, there were, they were different from the beginning. From the beginning, they were a divided people, um, and I think that's very important to this story. Uh, the original vision of, of, of the pilgrims was to create what they had in Leiden um, on the other side of the Atlantic, but because for all sorts of logistical reasons, they needed to bring aboard um, uh, these strangers to, to fill out their settlement. Um, it, it created a, a, a very different dynamic uh, within the community. In the first several chapters of the book, you relay in a captivating narrative uh, the planning for the voyage and the details of the ship and the inauspicious efforts to leave England for the New World. Could you relay some of the, the pitfalls uh, that befell the would-be pilgrims uh, as they tried to leave England for the New World? Yeah, well, you know, the, the pilgrims, um, uh, you know, the, the core group were religious idealists in a way, and they knew each other wonderfully well, but when it came to people outside of their own congregation, they, they you know, it was, they were a little at sea, and they were uh, perfect um, uh, prey for someone who is trying to get the better of them. And so what you see constantly as they're plan trying to plan this outrageous uh, thing to do, I mean, and no one has experience in doing something like this. You know, they were farmers and weavers and, you know, uh, to become a potential pioneer uh, um, uh, is, is a skill set that, you know, they did not have. And so they, they, um, th there was a uh, uh, a Weston, who was the you know the their their sort of money guy, the merchant adventurers who were providing the capital, and um and, and they had to have an agreement with them how much time they would work uh, once they got to the new world to to help pay off their the debts they were incurring. There were all sorts of arguments over that agreement, uh, uh, and and then how were they going to get there? It was Weston's job to provide a, a major, a main, main craft, which would become the Mayflower. The Pilgrims decided to bring their own smaller vessel, the Speedwell. And I think the Speedwell is an example of kind of um, how, how disorganized and, and um, misplaced much of their energies were. They, at great expense, they bought this vessel. They had it completely re-rigged uh, in a way that ultimately um, meant that the ship was leaking all the time and, and it would delay their departure. And, you know, so this was one, and they will ultimately have to abandon it. Um, and then, you know, the, the delay after delay after delay, they began to consume their provisions even before they left England. The whole plan originally was to leave early in the summer so that they would arrive with plenty of time to uh, build the houses that would get them through the winter. But it was September uh, before the, the the Mayflower, now with 102 uh, passengers, uh, would leave Plymouth uh, bound for the New World. This was the worst possible time uh, to be leaving. And, and so um, it, this was 
truly an inauspicious beginning. So once they finally were on their way, consolidated down now to a single ship, the Mayflower, after a nearly 10-week harrowing trip across the sea, before setting foot on land, the passengers, the adult males at least, wrote out the Mayflower Compact, uh, the anniversary of which was yesterday, uh, as a means of creating a system under which they would operate uh, beyond the very timely practical nature what is the significance of the Mayflower Compact and where did those authors draw their inspiration? Yeah, the Mayflower Compact is one of those fundamental uh, documents of American history. It is not, as some people have uh, seemed to suggest, the, the U.S. Constitution in utero. Um, you know, it did not, it was not the Declaration of Independence meets, it, it was a very different document, but it was nonetheless extraordinary. And what had happened, they were supposed to not go to New England, where they ultimately ended up, but to the Hudson River, the mouth of the Hudson River. And um, they, they um, uh, tried to get there after uh, landfall at the tip of the Cape Cod, but ran into um, Pollock, Pollock Rip, almost destroyed the ship. The captain says, whoa, <laughs> we're not going to... to uh, to the Hudson, it's late in the season. I need to get you guys off my ship um, soon. You're, we're going around the point to what is now uh, Provincetown Harbor. Now, the problem with this was that they didn't have a patent from uh, the king uh, for a settlement in this part of, of the New World. And so this uh, meant it's many of the strangers um, who you know, did not share uh, the, the pilgrims' uh, solidar religious solidarity said, whoa, all bets are off. You know, we're, we're um, you know, once we get to land, we're going our own way. Um, they may have seen from what they've seen in the voyage, they may have realized that, you know, these were, this is not what we want, but this would have been destroyed the settlement at the beginning. They needed to work together. And so uh, instead of putting down the rebels, um, they uh, put pen to paper and drafted uh, the May, what we call the Mayflower Compact, in which everyone submitted, uh, would submit to the rule of civil government. Um, and, and so, and this is extraordinary. I mean, it didn't change the kind of government they had known in England, but this was something that they were all putting together, um, uh, agreeing to th 3,000 miles from home. And, um, and so this is extraordinary. This is the, you know, this is, this is the attempt to deal with dissension, not through putting down the rebels, but by coming to the table and coming to an agreement. And uh, with that, uh, once they sail, as they were sailing into Provincetown Harbor, uh, each uh, male and, uh, uh, member of, of the passengers would, would sign, sign his name to this document. And is it right that uh, part of their inspiration for the language in the compact came from their uh, former leader, John Robinson, who ultimately did not make that initial voyage with them? Absolutely. And, you know, and John Robinson, um, this is, this is kind of one of the tragedies of, of the Pilgrim story from Bradford's uh, point of view is the fact that their minister, John Robinson, the, the man upon whom they all depended for their leadership, did not make that voyage uh, because of all of the mishaps they've had. They had most of their congregation was still in light uh, when the Mayflower departed, and it was determined that Robinson should stay with those people uh, in in Leiden. But uh, Robinson anticipated many of the issues they would have, particularly when it came to the strangers, and so he had suggested that they do something like this. And the Mayflower Compact. You, it's, it's got the phraseology of Robinson all over it. And, um, and, and, uh, and I think in many ways you could, uh, he's, he's kind of the Thomas Jefferson to the Mayflower Compact uh, uh, when it comes to the, you know, the wordsmith that uh, potentially made this thing uh, happen. There are two main parts to your book. Uh, the circumstances of the pilgrims as told through the life of William Bradford and then King Philip's War as told through the life of Benjamin Church. Uh, who are these men and how did you come to choose these two figures to tell the story? Well, William Bradford uh, was the one I encountered by reading Oak Plymouth Plantation. And Bradford was, was 
a teenager uh, when he first um, became a part of the congregation in Scrooby. And uh, he would uh, become a leading member of the congregation in Leiden. And uh, soon after the uh, arrival of the, of, of the pilgrims uh, you know, in, in what they would call Plymouth, he would um, eventually become governor. And he would basically have that, that role for the rest of his life. And um, he, he would, uh, and, and so and he, 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 he has this tremendous record of what happened in a Plymouth plantation. And so I, you know, I, I, I write narrative history in which I have, I focus on character and character development and, and tell the story. And uh, you need the evidence, you need the perspective. And so that was my, that was the perspective I wanted to tell the, the first part of the story. And um, Benjamin Church was a uh, third, his, his maternal uh, uh, grandfather had been on the uh, uh, Mayflower and uh, he, would, he was uh, 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 a young man uh, uh, creating a, 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 and a, he was a carpenter and he was in uh, what he called Saconet, Rhode Island, now Little Compton, uh, just at the time when uh, what would become King Philip's War broke out. And he would uh, become, uh, and by, by that point, he had uh, become very close with the Sakonet uh, people uh, around there and, and, um, and took a great interest in, in what was happening and was very upset with how uh, the, the Plymouth's uh, governor was, was handling all this. And as the violence would spread, he would become involved in, in the war and, um, and would become a kind of Forrest Gump character in that, you know, when something happened, he tended to be there. And he would ultimately lead um, the, the relatively small band of English and native peoples uh, that would um, uh, uh, kill Philip at the, at the at end of the war. And um, I, I felt, and he laid in lot, he clearly kept a notebook of all his, um, uh, what happened during the war. And late in life, um, with the help of a son, uh, he would publish uh, his account of, of King Philip's War. And, you know, it's, it's his account, and like all uh, personal accounts, it's, you know, he puts himself in the best possible light, but it, it, was, a, it was a perspective um, and, uh, that I, I felt would, would be an interesting way to lead the reader uh, through the ins and outs of, of this terrible conflict. It's through Bradford's history, of course, that we have uh, much of our perspective, contemporary perspective on the Pilgrims, uh, although he began writing this in about 1630 or so. And he is arguably a famous Pilgrim. Uh, so there are likely some preconceived notions attached to him. Was there anything that surprised you as you began delving deeper into the life of, of Bradford and or his aims? Yeah, I, initially, what surprised me in the, the early years is how, um, you know, he was making it up as he was going along, as they all were, um, because this did not prove to be the blank slate they had anticipated. Uh, they had to deal, the, the native peoples were there before them, and for their own survival, uh, in fact, Plymouth Colony would not have uh, survived without the intervention of the Wampanoag leader Massasoit. Um, and, and it was that alliance that made possible um, uh, uh, Plymouth Colony to develop. And, and it was uh, Bradford's um, uh, ability to work um, with Massasoit and other native leaders and, and the, the various factions within his, his own community uh, that surprised me. Um, you know, this man of, of a fervent religious belief really proved to be a, a very uh, adaptable um, and, and far, far-sighted leader. But what truly surprised me about uh, Bradford and was that, that you know, once most of his life, once uh, the, the colony had taken root and you know, most people have thought what a great success it was, he saw it as a complete failure uh, because his original ambition uh, was not to create a, a great colony um, of, of numerous villages uh, that extended to Cape Cod and up towards what become Boston. He wanted to create that, recreate that congregation uh, that they had known under John Robinson 
um, and, uh, in Leiden, where by the, Robinson uh, had died, never making his way to Plymouth. Um, the, and so the congregation never became what he had hoped. And, and instead of uh, re their religious beliefs being the driver of, of the next generation of, 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 of colonists, uh, it became more and more about, about uh, making a better living, about land, about uh, acquisition. And this deeply saddened uh, uh, Bradford. And um, it's, it's, it's a very mournful tone of Plymouth Plantation takes in its latter chapters. In addition to Bradford's account and uh, churches, were there other types of resources that you use to research this book? Yeah, uh, you know, it, it was, um, there, there were their narratives, of course, but it's just tremendous treasure trove of documents. Um, uh, at whether it's the Massachusetts Historical Society, the State Library, which you know, has Bradford's manuscript, which is just one of the most incredible uh, documents I've had the pleasure to work with. Um, and, and, but there's diaries, there's letters, there's other histor history accounts written at that time. And there's also accounts written by people who are not fans of the, the Pilgrims. Um, uh, uh, there was Morton of, of uh, Maypole of Ma Marymount fame, who, 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 you know, came to realize in talking with the native peoples, because very early on after that first Thanksgiving, uh, there would be a, the equivalent of a commando raid led by Miles Standish against the, the Massachusetts in what was known as Wessagusset, sort of the Weymouth area, and uh, which completely changed things. And, uh, and it was a, an act of violence that had huge reverberations. And Morton would provide details from the, his native allies who, you know, told about this. And so there were, were elements of the story that you could get from documents outside of those generated by the Pilgrims and, and the Puritans, who were the, the, the settlers who came into Massachusetts in 1630 and after. But also there was the archaeology, um, which uh, proved uh, extraordinarily important on both sides, particularly the native side of the story. And so, uh, and, and then there are various artifacts scattered throughout the archives of of uh, the, some of the institutions I've, I've mentioned. And, and so all of this uh, put together uh, became the basis of, of what I tried to work with. And what about uh, genealogical resources uh, or scholarship? Uh, that's certainly an interest amongst uh, many of our audience members this evening. Well, I have to say Robert Anderson's uh, Pilgrim's Migration was uh, kind of, <laughs> it was, you know, a bit Bible, a research Bible for me. It is one of the most, um, and not only that, but the, the Great Migration, which deals with the, the, the Puritan wave that came into Boston, um, because that, they became a big part of the story, um, uh, especially, you know, so that, that volume has more information, more detailed information than is I could think humanly possible to contain, and it's it 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 was a huge help to me. And um, and you know I urge anyone with an interest in this period um, to to get your get a copy of it because it's just it really is, and it's also just a good read. Um, the the biographies are, are 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 well really well executed. Well, well, that wasn't orchestrated at all, but I'll, I'll just mention, of course, that um, at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, we are the, the sponsors of the Great Migration Study Project and the publishers of uh, Robert Charles Anderson's uh, work. And um, I'll actually say a little bit more about this later, but I uh, appreciate you uh, mentioning that. Um, turning to the, the native perspective, um, as you were talking just a moment ago, we are, of course, in a time of, of heightened awareness of cultural biases and, and the importance of presenting history authentically and inclusively. How did you approach gaining the native perspective on the Mayflower story and King Philip's War? Yeah, well, it's a huge challenge, um, you know, because you know, historians use you know, rely on the evidence, the written documentary evidence. And in this case, it's written by the English. Um, that said, that, that you know, there's native voices that come through that, particularly when it comes to the recordings of, of uh, native oral traditions, but it's still, um, uh, you know, really, it's, it's very difficult. And so um, my engagement with um, uh, this side of the story began with A Way Offshore, my first work of history. After completing that, 
I realized and this is a this tells the history of Nantucket with uh, each chapter being the story of a person that it then advances the, the story history of the of the um, the island and uh, there are native figures I, I focus on but but when I was done with it I realized you know geez it's just this this has not done justice to the native side of the story. And so I would, um, out of that frustration, would dedicate the next four years of my life uh, to researching and writing uh, Abram's Eyes, uh, uh, which uh, was uh, an account of the native legacy of Nantucket Island. And um, I uh, visited with and, and spoke to Wampanoags and on the vineyard, and on the Cape, um, uh, John Peters was the tribal medicine man at that time in the 90s. Uh, Tony Pollard, uh, otherwise Nana Passionate, who was the head of the, the Wampanoag program at, at Plymouth Plantation. And Russell Gardner, uh, who uh, had, was the uh, tribal historian of the Wampanoag people. Um, he was particularly a, a font of information for me. Um, uh, we went on a road trip um, that he, he lived in Monponset Mon Pond, um, which um, in Halifax, Massachusetts, which is almost kind of a ground zero for the beginning of King Philip's War because it's there where uh, Metacom's older brother, Wamsutta, um, would be captured uh, by Josiah Winslow, the son of, of, of Edward Winslow and, and eventually governor of, of Plymouth during King Philip's War. He would seize Wamsutta, and Wamsutta would then, uh, when he was sort of brought into the authorities, die under very mysterious circumstances. And this would create, this would bring uh, Medicom to power, but it would lay the groundwork for what would ultimately uh, become King Philip's War. And so Russell, uh, we did a road trip. Russell didn't actually have a license. <laughs> he didn't drive a car, but we we drove around and, and um, uh, he was just a huge help, and and um, and so when it uh, came to writing um, uh, uh, Abram's eyes, and Abram Quarry uh, was known as the you know the last Indian on Nantucket, where many New England towns had, and this was an absolute fictional concept. Um, there's uh, there was never a last Indian. The native peoples are present and vibrant um, pr presence to this day in New England, uh, but. With that book, I, um, I, I, I worked with the oral traditions, uh, archaeology, um, and the, this, the, the, uh, the, the interviews I had done with, with various people and, and tried and, and really laid the groundwork um, for what would become uh, uh, Mayflower. An important and, and tragic, if unexpected, issue of the time preceding the Mayflower's arrival and following King Philip's War was slavery. Can you speak to the role of slavery and its relationship to, to the Native people and its influences on that period and beyond? I mean, slavery was one of the reasons why the issue of slavery um, was one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book. And if you read the preface of Mayflower, it begins with two voyages the voyage of the Mayflower and the voyage of the Seaflower, uh, which was a, a, a slave ship um, uh, of Wampanoag uh, prisoners. Because uh, what happened during King Philip's War, uh, uh, Wampanoag warriors um, and sometimes women and children uh, were enslaved, were, were, because they had led a rebellion, uh, were sentenced to life of slavery. Uh, in the West Indies. And so uh, the sea flower left with more than a hundred uh, uh, of these Wampanoag uh, enslaved people and, um, and headed to, to the Caribbean. And, you know, this is not, and so, you know, the story of the Mayflower is one in which it tells a story of how one people's quest for religious freedom led to the uh, enslavement of, of another. And you know, I I think slavery, you know, is is kind of the key issue here. Not only you know in this story, but in American history, particularly as we're beginning to appreciate finally now. And you know, once again, the story of of 
Plymouth Colony is not one of exceptionalism, not one of, you know, um, this was the one shining example of, of things. This was, was, it's a tragedy where the promise ends up where it does uh, with, with actually the institution of slavery uh, in New England. And, and so uh, once again, I think it was a great, it's a great tragedy, but it's, it's, it, it was one of the motivations for my taking on this book. Historical events can often have an air of inevitability about them. Was King Philip's War the logical intergenerational outcome of the Mayflower's arrival in this tense 55 year piece, if you will? Well, you know, history, you, uh, we are given the benefit of hindsight. Uh, where, you know, you can argue that, yes, this was the way it was de doomed, destined to happen. And in fact, it would be a story that would be repeated over and over again um, in American history as, as uh, uh, the, the, the white settlers moved west. But it's not how it felt then um, to, the, to the people on either side. Uh, when violence actually broke out, um, uh, uh, it, everyone was kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? Uh, because for more than 50 years, uh, there had been this bicultural um, community. It was not ideal by any stretch of the imagination, but it's almost conceivable today, given how intertwined the two communities were in Plymouth Colony. Uh, Plymouth Colony did not really have a hinterland the way Massachusetts and Connecticut did. Uh, uh, the, 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 the two peoples were, were living right close to one another, particularly when it came to what's now Barrington and, and Warren and, and, and all of that area. And so, yeah, it was headed that way, but ultimately I think it comes to a story of leadership. Uh, 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 Josiah Winslow, um, the, the governor of Plymouth Colony, um, you know, he, 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 all the signs were there he did nothing to help uh, Medicom in trying to uh, control some of the elements there. And so it all came to this, uh, this violent um, uh, head. And, uh, and, and so you know, I think that's the thing we need to, you know, it's, there are trends that, that seem remorseless. And yet there is also human agency. There is the, the, the power of leadership. And, I, and that's one of the things I wanted to explore with this book. Well, thank you, Nat. I think at this time, we're going to take a look at some of our uh, considerable number of questions that have been submitted uh, by our audience members this evening. Uh, and so uh, giving a start here, uh, looking at the book and how much of the story takes place after the arrival of the Mayflower, how did you decide to call the book Mayflower? <laughs> Very good question. I didn't want to call it Mayflower, to tell you the truth, but I couldn't... Um but I couldn't come up with a title uh, that did justice to it. And, um, and, you know, Mayflower is how it begins. And so, yeah, it's, it, 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 it leads you <laughs> in one direction and it doesn't do justice to what the book is about, but I, I was baffled at trying to come up with something else that would do it justice. And, you know, and ultimately now when I look back, I mean, cause this book came out 14 years ago you know, I think it is the right title. It's, it's, it's how a voyage that has this iconic status in American history led to the, you know, to, uh, it was a voyage to war in many ways. Uh, it would take five decades to unwind, to, to evolve, but, um, and so there it goes. But yes, it's, um, um, many readers go, wait, this is not the story of a voyage. Um, this is something different. And, uh, and, uh, that's the way it is. Did any of your research uh, lead you to understand any differences between uh, how certain groups of Native people and the Europeans interacted when they first arrived? For example, were there any differences between the relationships uh, of the Nauset and the first Europeans uh, and the first Europeans and the Wampanoags? Yeah, well, you know, the, the term Wampanoag is one that was uh, applied after um, the, the time frame discussed in Mayflower. Um, you know, at the time when um, the pilgrims arrive, uh, the native peoples are, are, are known for their village sites. And so, yes, there's the Nossets, um, uh, there's, there's uh, 
they're you know they're, they're manamits that you know they're all manamoics they're they're all over the there's all over the place and Poconokets is where Massasoit was he identified himself as a Poconokit uh, not as a Wampanoag and so um, it was you know and and it became obvious uh, as as the, the uh, Bradford and, and pilgrims were in, interacting uh, with Massasoit that these villages were not always on Massasoit's wavelength um, and that his uh, leadership of of these villages was was not as as total as as they would have liked to have believed because they really just wanted to deal with one person. It was much more complicated than that. It, you could almost compare it to um, the city states of of Italy, um, uh, in which uh, there there were you know groups that were rivals at times, aligned, uh, but it was very complex and moving all the time with all sorts of moving parts. And so, um, yeah, each, each uh, you know, when it came to the, the Nossets, when the pilgrims were trying to figure out where they were first going to, uh, to, to settle, uh, they had their first encounter uh, with uh, the native peoples at, at uh, first, it's now known as First Encounter Beach on the north shore of the Cape, and, and these were the Nossets. And so um, uh, it, it, it is a very complex story and, and one in which um, you really need to look at the, the specific villages, particularly uh, in the first years of, of, of this story. Uh, returning to some of the uh, origins of the voyage, uh, one of our audience members has asked about what were the conditions in, in England um, that necessitated permission to leave? And if this was the free practice of, of a different religion was uh, against the law, um, wh why did England allow this to happen? Well, that's a very good question. They really didn't. Um, and so the, the pilgrims had to sneak out of uh, England and it would take them more than one attempt uh, to, to do it. And, and, um, and Bradford describes this, you know, they're, they're, they make their way to the east, eastern coast of England near the Stour River and, and uh, the authorities arrive as they're, they're loading up this vessel to take them to, to Holland and the men are on it, but not the women and children. The authorities arrive, uh, the captain of the vessel sails off, leaving the women there. And, you know, it's just a horror show. And eventually they would get over there, but it was, it was tough. And, and it was, you know, there, was, there were spies uh, from, you know, the, the government always looking up. So it was a, you know, a lot of kind of cloak and dagger, really, when it came to their attempts to, um, to, to leave the country. Another question from our audience. There were earlier attempts at English settlements in North America, uh, Jamestown, uh, the Popham colony of Maine, for example. Do you know what influence any of these had on Plymouth? Yeah, they, the, uh, they had a, a lot, they were a cautionary. Jamestown should have been a cautionary tale as, as a Popham, but, you know, because they, Jamestown would ultimately hang in there, but its first years, first decade was horrific, you know, where most people would die. And um, it was just terrible. And, um, uh, you know, and that, if you call that a success, success, it's not anything to base your hopes on. And in the early years of the Plymouth uh, settlement, uh, they would learn uh, through some cod fishermen of, um, a, 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 na a native rebellion attack in Jamestown uh, that came close to wiping out uh, the Jamestown settlement. And this came at a time of extreme tension uh, with Massasoit and, and um, uh, the native allies, uh, the, the uh, Tisquanto or Squanto as it's popularly known, who was operating as Bradford's uh, interpreter uh, had angered Massasoit who wanted uh, uh, Tisquantum to, 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 to be executed for this and, and Bradford refused and it just created this whole era of, of great tension. And they learned the news of, of, um, of the attacks in Jamestown and this contributed to um, the, this, the sense of, of dread and terror that they, that would then lead and, and help inspire uh, uh, 
Standish's attack um, on uh, West Augusset uh, to the north. And so, um, yeah, they were intertwined. But remember, this is a time when, you know, a tweet doesn't go out, you know, and, and you learn. Uh, it takes time for, for these kinds of things to happen. And so the intense isolation the Pilgrims felt um, uh, is, is, is something that I think um, uh, was, was one that added to the, the, the just the whole uh, difficulties that they experienced. You've spoken about the role of slavery uh, as it pertains to uh, the native people of the region. There's also a notion of, of indentured servitude uh, for the Mayflower passengers. Uh, one of our audience members has asked you if you could speak to what was the nature of this uh, indentured servitude of the passengers? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's been called a kind of version of, of slavery in a way, but I mean, what it gave someone who could not afford uh, to, to make the passage would um, sign papers um, to become an indentured servant, which meant they had to, they had to serve their, their master for a specific period of time, often it was seven years, it could be a variety of times, and then they would win their freedom. And, um, and so there were you know, quite a few people of that kind um, uh, among uh, the passengers on, on the Mayflower. Uh, one, John Howland, um, uh, his, uh, his, his master and, and uh, uh, master's wife, Carvers, uh, who was the first uh, uh, governor would die. And, um, and this seems to have given Howland the opportunity to sort of you know, free of that and become a, a one of the um, um, you know, influential citizens of, of uh, Plymouth Colony. So there was some mobility, but yes, there was, you know, this was, there, there was, this was not a group of, you know, this was not democracy as, as we have come to know it by any means. This is a stratified society. Uh, and uh, you can see um, throughout the history of Plymouth Colony that this creates uh, tensions and, and violence will occasionally uh, flare up. And so, you know, add, adding to the travails of, 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 um, of, of leadership uh, when it came to Plymouth Colony. Uh, given that there were these earlier colonies and, and some ultimately successful, why do you think that the Plymouth Colony and the story of the Pilgrims um, has prevailed as America's founding story by and large? Yeah, it's a very good question. You know, I, uh, well, there's, I think it really comes down to the holiday of Thanksgiving. I mean, it has given the Pilgrim story a, you know, an annual, you know, hey, we're, we're here we are on, on, thank, on in November. It's, it, it provided them with a kind of a, a publicity platform uh, that Jamestown, that the others don't have. You know, and the other side of it is, you know, the, they were, um, Many, they were in search of religious, their religious freedom. Uh, it's not just a story of going over there and trying to make as much uh, money as possible. And yet, of course, that becomes a part of the story. And so, you know, there's there's the ability to look at it in in more positive and and idealistic terms. But I think so much of it has the fact that um, it's it's you know their story is part of a national holiday. And so it's, it's given it an iconic role that, you know, is not necessarily deserved. Um, you cannot say that the story of Plymouth Colony is in somehow the fundamental beginning of America. You know, there is Jamestown. Um, there are, you know, all these others. It's, it's, uh, there's no such thing as the beginning. And that's kind of what my book is about is, you know, we, we all want a beginning a point where before we got into the muddled mess we live in now, there was a time when everything was, was clear and fresh, but no, there isn't. And um, the story of the pilgrims, I think exemplifies that ultimately. And yet it is the one uh, people tend to look to as that so-called beginning. And we of course are commemorating the quadricentennial of the pilgrims and upcoming uh, in 2030 will be the quadricentennial of the Mass Bay Colony. Uh, could you speak to the difference between the, the Pilgrims and the Mass Bay Colony uh, settlers, so-called Puritans? Yeah, you know, it's, it's an important distinction. In, in many ways, the separatists of Plymouth 
um, they were they were the the poor poor people's version of of this. Uh, they they tended to come from more humble uh, humble circumstances, and they were true religious radicals. I mean, they were self-professed uh, separatists. Uh, the Puritans who uh, came over in the Great Way Migration beginning in, in 1630 uh, were, were Puritans in that they uh, want, you know, they were looking to purify um, their religion by a, a closer communion with God um, separated from the fixings of established what, religion, but they did not publicly claim to be separatists. Um, they were trying to sort of have their cake and eat it too. And they also tended to come from uh, higher echelons in, in English society and, and they were better educated. And, um, and there were many more of them when they came over in that great big wave. And so, you know, um, uh, the, the, so they, they it's, it's kind of amazing how quickly things would shift in New England where, you know, Plymouth Colony was was it for 10 years. And then suddenly comes this great wave of Puritans by, by John Winthrop and others. And it would be not only Massachusetts, which included what we now call Maine, but also Connecticut to the South um, as they followed the Connecticut River up. And so um, Plymouth Colony found, it, found it an ally in a way, but it was an uneasy alliance. And yet, you know, in, in another sense, um, as soon as the Puritans came over, they were separatists. They were on the other side of the Atlantic. And so you, you, you see a distinction uh, that uh, begins to fade to a certain extent. But I would argue to this day that the North Shore of Boston and the South Shore of Boston are very different. Um, you know, there's just a different sense to them. And I think a lot of that uh, goes back to uh, the differences uh, between uh, the Pilgrims to the South and the Puritans to the North. Another question from our audience. Um, have you found any female narratives uh, associated with this period um, in your research? Yeah, well, one of the um, uh, narratives that um, I, I, I latched onto when it came to telling the story of King Philip's War was the story of Mary Rowlandson, uh, who uh, was, was abducted um, during a, a, a a raid, native raid, and she and her her you know kid her her one of her her kids die, and and uh, she ends up you know with the native peoples as they um, work their way around uh, New England and are pursued by the English army, and so she provides a very moving uh, testimony as as um, one of her children literally dies in her arms. And, but also a, a keen observer that uh, offers all sorts of details about um, what was going on internally uh, when it came to uh, the native leadership uh, during the war. Um, she she's, speaks with Medicom and, and other native leaders, provides descriptions. And, um, and so it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating journal and it, you know and it comes from a woman and so that that was important uh, to me and then the other there are all letters written uh, particularly many of them at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester uh, whose archives are tremendously important to me letters describing um, uh, attacks uh, during King Philip's war from women that are you know just uh, very illustrative and, and important uh, documents and so um, but you know, once again, there there is a challenge of of you know the the evidence versus uh, the other from the male perspective. Uh, also, from our audience, uh, you describe in the book how uh, once the pilgrims have arrived, how the the land was divvied up based on uh, family size uh, and such. Uh, do we have any documents showing uh, where exactly the plots were by family and, and their exact size? Yeah, I think it's pretty well laid out. And if you go to um, Plymouth Plantation today um, and, and uh, you know, what they have created, you know, a, 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 not in a different part, piece of land, but they have created very closely what it looked like. Um, there. And it is, it's, it's very interesting, um, you know, how it was laid out on the edge of a, on a hit side of a hill. 
and um, with with the fort up up top, and um, and and yes, you can see it laid out. It's 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 one of these things where um, it's it was fascinating to me to see how the settlement came into gradual being, where you know you have them you know, building their first structures um, in, in late December of, of that winter. And then uh, gradually as, as um, you know, they were, half of them would die, um, creating all sorts of turmoil within all families would be clear cut from the community with Massasoit's uh, decision to, to create an alliance. Um, you see, as they, as the, the pilgrims trying to, to figure out what to do, they, 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 they decide to build a fort um, as, as they watch the complexity of the native um, and unpredictability, unpredictability of, of their interactions with the native peoples. And then they also a fence around it. And um, you know, huge undertakings for this uh, very you know, small group of people uh, were underfed and all this, but this gradual development of, of a town uh, as, as, as uh, the history unfolds. Again, returning to uh, the origins of the voyage, uh, someone has asked, uh, given the circumstances in England, um, how did people get chosen to board the Mayflower or the Speedwell? Um, or was there not uh, a line to the ship, so to speak? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a great, I mean, it, it was chaos. Uh, you know, it was funny. They were cutting people back, but the fact of the matter is people were, it was becoming increasingly clear to the passengers as delay after delay after delay after the Speedwell was, you know, coming in for repairs, going out, having to come back. It was clear that things were going terribly. And so you saw a lot of people who just wanted to get out of it. Um, a lot of people saw this as a doomed venture. And, um, and, and, but there were others who were just, were gonna go for this. And so it would, uh, you know, some people did not make it and would come uh, a year later, but it was, uh, you know, it was, it, it was just a, a, talk about a, you know, a psychodrama, you know, as, as they're, they're what, you know, they're ready to go, but it's just not unfolding the way they predicted. And, and they just know once they get there, they're gonna be in a terrible position. And so you, you just see families grappling with this. Do we keep going? Do we get out of this? And um, ultimately it would be those 102 passengers. I think, and you lay this out very well in the book, it, it's interesting to note the timeline, uh, just to understand how many delays there were, uh, that the Speedwell left Delfshaven, uh, Holland in July, I think it was July 22nd. And therein the delays start to, to pile up until September 6th. So imagine beginning your Atlantic voyage um, in July versus the beginning of, of September. And well, so it was, yeah, and, and I have to say when uh, I spent considerable time in England tracking those movements and, um, and, and I, I think it was Dartmouth where uh, they would duck into before they would end up in Plymouth. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's this, it's like a, a open mouth cave. Uh, you know, they had gone in there and it's a, it's a rocky harbor, very, very confined. And it was there where they were beginning to panic. You know, people are going, what are we doing here? And that was, you know, they would, uh, and people wanted to leave, but they wouldn't let them at that stage. They would then get to Plymouth, realize it's only the Mayflower we're gonna go with and, and off they would go in September. Indeed, I think uh, some of your uh, research, and you lay this out in the book, that um, leaving Dartmouth, um, they had traveled some 300 miles and then had to turn back around yet again uh, because of issues with the Speedwell. Um, you know, really a, a sort of demoralizing set of experiences, which again, uh, whittled down the number of, of uh, ultimate passengers uh, on the ship. Well, you know, the Speedwell is interesting too, because uh, there would be evidence that would come forward later that makes it pretty apparent uh, that the, uh, the, May the, the pilgrims were being uh, manipulated by the Dutch government. The Dutch didn't want um, uh, the, this group of religious radicals to settle in the Hudson River area because that's where they were thinking of establishing a settlement, which would become, uh, you know, the New, ne New Netherlands and Manhattan. And um, the, uh, later would come uh, a story that uh, uh, 
uh, they were actually scheming against the pilgrims and that the speedwell, uh, which with all its problems uh, were related to the, the Captain Reynolds that uh, may have been purposely uh, making this vessel leak. Uh, he had overseen the, the remasting of the ship with a much taller spar. And this seems to have opened up the, the, um, the, the spaces between the planks. And, and you know, he could pretty much leak, make it leak at will. Uh, as Bradford would later say, they, you know, they would sell this, this uh, vessel at great loss. It would get remasted and then be perfectly fine for years to come. And so once again, we see this group of people who knew each other wonderfully well, but had a hard time understanding the motivations and the complexities of the situation beyond their own little band. Uh, in uh, keeping an eye on our, our clock, um, I'll conclude with um, a broad question for you, which is, you know, we are in a time at which we're, we're looking to history for for lessons. Uh, are there elements of this story of, of courage, community, and war that we should be thinking about today? Absolutely. I, you know, I, I have to say in the last, this year, this story has seemed to me, I, I just keep flashing back uh, to this story in a couple of ways. Oh, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Well, we this is bad, right? This pandemic. Well, can you imagine what the native peoples uh, in the years before the arrival of the pilgrims went through when you know, a series of European spawned epidemics uh, uh, took away as many as 80% of, of their population along the coast. And you know, this was um, the diseased, havoc people uh, that would, uh, the, the pilgrims would, would, would confront. And you know, so, wow, I mean, that's there. Uh, and and you know, this gives, for me, I, I mean, I, I know how scary these times are. We're not even close to what it was like as far as what was going on um, in this part of the world in the years before 1620. And then there's the issue of slavery. Um, you know, I think uh, for so my growing up, slavery was at the edges of the uh, conversation when it came to America's past. Now it is the conversation in many ways. And I think this story, um, uh, with you know this this voyage for, of for, of promise would end up with slavery uh, being established uh, when it came to the their former native allies is one that um, is a deeply disturbing but deeply relevant uh, to the challenges we're all facing today. Well, thank you, Nat. It's uh, always a pleasure to chat with you. I well, Ryan, thank you. It, it really is is great to. To, to talk with you about this. So thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take about five minutes just to wrap up with some previews and some uh, resources that our viewers can learn about. Uh, but first, Nathaniel, thank you so much for taking on this journey into history to uh, understand our inherited past in a little bit more detail and for helping navigate the complexity of the issues that uh, we've really uncovered tonight. And also, Ryan, thank you for steering the conversation really towards, uh, towards answers that we're, we're beginning to look for. Uh, we have had over about 1,800 uh, viewers on tonight's program uh, from across the country, almost all states of the U.S. represented, as well as as far afield as um, Australia. So thank you all for joining and for asking almost 100 questions in told. Uh, but now for the unanswered questions, uh, let's hear from our partners about uh, other resources that are available and other upcoming events. Uh, Beth, what's going on at the State Library? Well, I want to give my thanks to, to everyone who's participated. I suspect that, like me, we all learn something new every time we pick up uh, the book and think about everything that's happened since Mayflower first arrived. And by Mayflower, I mean both the ship and the book. So I hope you'll all feel welcome to come to the State Library in the Massachusetts State House uh, after we reopen. In the meantime, please go to our website and you'll see a, a description of our holdings, our services, and our programs, especially the Bradford Manuscript, which is featured prominently on our homepage. And the easiest way to get there, I mean, there's a link type in your 
search engineems.gov slash lib and you'll go right to her homepage. And Ryan will give you one minute to hear about uh, upcoming uh, talks and resources at NHGS. Thank you, David. Uh, well, in commemoration of the landing of the Mayflower and in honor of the legacies of the Pilgrim and Wampanoag people, we've created a free online portal, mayflower.americanancestors.org, uh, which is linked in the chat. And here you will find uh, genealogical sketches of each of the Mayflower passengers with information about their origins in England or Holland and what is known and documentable about their occupations, education, civic service, amongst other things. And of course, their vital record material, information on births, marriages, children, and deaths. You'll also find an interactive timeline of the Mayflower story, as well as resources, uh, historical and genealogical for native people of the region. And we also have two of our newest publications uh, featured on this site of Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford, the 400th anniversary edition, which is a newly transcribed and annotated publication of Bradford's history that incorporates the work of scholars of colonial American, English, and Dutch history, and includes a very important introductory essay by Paula Peters of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. And we have the newest publication by Robert Charles Anderson that Matt, uh, Nat mentioned earlier, the Mayflower Migration, Immigrants to Plymouth, 1620. This is a volume that uh, has all of the latest genealogical and historical scholarship about the Mayflower passengers. And each of those uh, are for sale there on Mayflower.American Ancestors with a special discount for our participants this evening. Once again, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you to our guest moderator, our partners, and our special guest, Nathaniel Philbrick. Um, please, everybody, wherever you are, be well, be safe. See you next time. <laughs>